Hi again, good evening to everyone. Thank you for joining me, whether or not you're live in the webinar or if you're in the first section on YouTube. So we are taking on a big subject and I'll be running through a number of slides and I'll be trying to capture some of the ideas around what I think is likely to happen in the context of prey and disease. It's complex, no doubt about it. And it's very difficult to know for certain what actually is the likely approach in terms of clinical presentation. All we can do is look at the science and see whether or not we can make sense of it. So without further ado, let's get straight into the main presentation. This is a big question. Can spike protein trigger a mad cow disease mimic? And in effect, I'll be taking you through what that means and how we can understand the patterns. As usual, there is a disclaimer. This is for information only. If you have an emergency or if you need to see your doctor, you make sure you do that. This information is here for us to look at, reflect on from a research point of view, and hope that answers will come in time. So we must stop thinking of CJD as rare and random. In a world of persistent spike proteins, prion disease may no longer be a distant threat, but an urgent signal. This is where we're going to start. And essentially, by the end of this presentation, for those who are here for the full webinar, I hope that you're going to grasp the prion-like behavior and how these misfolded uh, spike proteins can then be quite resilient, understanding the clinical features of rapid onset prion diseases, looking at emerging evidence with spike prion ne neurodegeneration, and potentially figuring out if there are any detoxification strategies targeting prion accumulation. That is a very important question because this is not something that we have any treatments for. And this is why this is such an important area that needs to be addressed. So let's see if we can understand a little bit more about what prions are. Here we have the important thing to grasp is that prions, neuronal prions are normal. And I've got here from this uh, paper, a new take on prion protein dynamics in cellular trafficking. And this paper is highlighting that the prions are normally on the surface there in terms of their, um, their, their helping with synaptic function. And um, what can happen is that if they get associated with abnormal prions, they then undergo changes. But it's important to note that part of the reason why prion diseases target neurology is because that's where most. And this is why it's relevant with regards to neuronal disease. So an important point for us to grasp when we think about what it is that we are doing and how it is that it has to be done. So the first observation with regards to prion diseases goes all the way back to 1732, and that's with Scrapey. It was first described in Great Britain in 1732, and farmers had noticed that sheep would compulsively scrape their bodies against fences and posts. This was why they called it Scrapey. It was fatal. It was a neurodegenerative disorder. They had behavioral changes. They became incoordinated and they had intense itching. That's why they were scraping all the time. And that was because of the changes in terms of brainstem function. And I'll tell you what, when I was doing the research, I realized that even in the context of long COVID itch, maybe a brainstem link. So you do come across interesting patterns that could be quite relevant, but known to be caused by misfolded prion proteins. Remember I showed you the normal ones first, and the scrapie was shown to be transmissible to other sheep via infected brain material, 
long before we realized what prions were. So it's a very complex disease and it has a long history. And when you think about what it looks like, this is the sheep. Because he's been rubbing so much on the posts, and you can see it better here, you can see that he's rubbed off all the wool on the neck and the back because of the intense itching. And that was the characteristic of the scrapie. Fascinating kind of presentation that they wouldn't have seen previously. And when we think about that's the sheep version of, um, of the prion disease, but in terms of the history with regards to CJD, that is a little bit later on. Crutzfeldt Jacob disease. It's again rare and it's a fatal brain disorder. And again, misfolded prion proteins and it triggers neurodegeneration. And the first case was in the 1920s. And the person had very rapid dementia, muscle stiffness, visual problems, unusual movements, and then they became comatose and died within a year. And the, there, it's important actually, a little later on in the presentation, I am going to be sharing my direct observation with a patient with CJD. I'd never seen it before. And you will see that it was even faster than that. Quite fascinating, which we'll share a little bit later on. But the point was that there are four main types. Uh, the sporadic type, which is most common, you have a genetic, and then there is medical transmission, iatrogenic, and then you have the variant, which is the mad count uh, or the BSE from eating infected meat. And it's important, I'll highlight here and I'll come back to it, is codon 129mm genotype is a major risk factor, especially for variant CJD. And I'll break this down a little bit more in just a minute or two so that you understand who is at risk, because it's quite fascinating that not everyone is at risk. When you look at a brain that has been affected by CJD, this is probably what it would look like. The brain is shrunken, it's shriveled, and you can't see it clearly here now, we'll come into it, but it's actually more like a sponge because there are so many little holes in this brain that have caused it to then become quite shriveled over time. And it's this neurodegeneration that causes all of the symptoms and it occurs quite quickly when it does occur. Now let's get to a little bit of the complexity. This is about prions. And I had to try and find multiple ways of explaining it. So I hope that this makes sense. So let's start with some basics about it. So the prions are, as I said, normal parts of the neuronal system, but they can become misfolded. And when they become misfolded, they can induce other prions to become misfolded as well. So you have here, this is what a normal prion would look like. And you can see this twiddly bit here. This is just a, an example picture. It's not actually what it looks like. But when it becomes abnormal, that twirly bit now becomes straight. And what then happens is that because this has, has happened, if one of these abnormal prions touch another normal prion, they become exactly the same. It's almost like a zombie protein. And so they are quite unique in that they are protein only infectious agents, very highly resistant to heat proteases. These are enzymes and decont de decontamination methods. You can't get rid of it easily. It's really unusual, this pattern that it has. And as I said, it's only because the body already has prions there that we have this potential issue occurring in the brain. One of the examples that I've used to put it across is it's like putting one bad strawberry in a tub of good strawberries. If you leave that for a day or two, all the strawberries will then start to get bad. However, what you must notice in this picture is that there are a few strawberries here that are getting bad, but this one isn't. And you'll understand why there are some people who are resistant to prion changes. And trying to understand who they are, 
is probably very valuable to trying to come up with strategies for it. But here is another example as to what would tend to happen. This normal prion would then take the abnormal shape. This is now PRPC becomes PRPSC with it being straight. And if this touches another normal protein, it will also become straight here. And once they become like that, suddenly they can aggregate into these formats very quickly. And then they build up over time. And this is what is insoluble and therefore does damage in the brain. Very interesting pattern that it has. And the other example that you can use with regards to prions is that of a crystal. It's kind of like how crystals grow. If you just leave them, they just build one on top of the other. They're very similar to what a prion will do, except it does it in the brain. And this is, as they say, they replicate and they fragment. So pieces will go from one part to the other, and then they grow there as well. And it's because of this replication that it is so neurotoxic. And they've found that mice that don't have prions are resistant to prion diseases. And that emphasizes the importance that this is happening specifically, not completely, but mostly with prion proteins. And as we said, you have the genetic, the sporadic, and the acquired forms. And this is just a picture of what a crystal looks like. And it grows in a very similar fashion. And over time, it will then do damage to the brain. That is an important part of what it does. And another analogy that I use to try and help you to get the, your head around it is that of a magnet. It's almost when you have a, a table with nuts and bolts on it. If you touch one with the magnet, that bolt becomes magnetized. And then it will then attract other nuts and bolts to it so that everything sticks together and builds up a structure. That's like what prions do. They influence other prions to then become magnetized and they attract to each other. And it's this buildup of protein that does damage in the brain. Again, as I said, these are all very complex points, but I'm hoping that the analogies will help you to make sense of it. Now, the question is, who is affected and why? This is where, again, it gets very, very interesting. There is a genetic factor involved. And what you've got here is a picture of chromosomes. And there is a particular gene, the PRNP gene, that encodes the normal prion protein, PRPC. Now, on codon 129 of this gene, there is a difference in terms of whether or not you have one amino acid, which is methanine, or another amino acid, which is valine. It can only be one or, one or the other. But because you get chromosomes from both mother and father, you would then have in this particular chromosome at this point either methionine, 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 valine, or valine, valine. This is just about genetics. If someone had the MM, they have the highest risk for CJD. That's about 37% uh, of a European po population. MV is delayed onset, so some protection, and that's about 51% of the population. And VV, if they have valine valine in this prion, they don't, very less common, and they are almost protected against prion diseases. That's 12% of the population in Europe. And so this is a very important point, and this is why they found even when there was the outbreak of mad cow disease, they knew about 38% of the population was at higher risk for it, but not necessarily all of the population. And when you look at that codon, um, that genetic predisposition, I then looked up what is the difference across different populations, different racial groups. And that now is very interesting. When you look at that MM genotype by population, Europeans, as we said, had about 37%. East Asians, 93 to 
Africans therefore only have a 15 to 25 percent risk across their population, a bit higher with South Asians and relatively high as well with Native Americans with this MM genotype. And so this then becomes very important in terms of trying to understand who may be at highest risk to try and mitigate it in terms of what is happening. So you may wonder, I'm talking about prions, and why am I talking about it now? Is it that there are more mad cows around? No, we've just had a pandemic. This is the bit that a lot of people don't quite understand. And I'm again trying to give you an example as to what it means in terms of the pandemic. And it's all about the spike protein. So what I've done is I've, I've created a diagram that hopefully gives you an insight into what I think is the important piece of information. On your left is the spike protein. And what happens is that when the spike protein is being degraded and cut up into little pieces so that it can be digested by the immune system, one segment on the inside has prion-like capabilities where if this gets in contact with a prion or other proteins that have that cap capability, it will trigger this kind of prion crystal formation. And therefore, when the spike protein as a whole doesn't necessarily have that prion tendency, when it is digested, there is a piece of it that then can do that kind of trigger. That is very, very important because one of the issues that made this come about was the research into embalmers' clots. And I'd always thought that it was likely that it occurred around, say, for instance, an, an immune-primed person who would have then had an infection in the recent past triggering an immune response, which would then lead to the, the, the partial disintegration of the spike protein, leaving pieces behind that could have prion capabilities. And when we see what happens with the spike protein, and this is from a paper about persistence of spike protein in the skull and meninges, when they looked at the difference between, say, influenza here, which shows you that it's primarily in the lungs, um, the Wuhan spike does show you a weak spread but if they inject that spike, meaning if you have high viral circulation, it literally goes through all the bloodstream into all the blood vessels, including the brain, the heart, the kidneys. This brain bit is where later on I'm going to explain that I think this is where the clinical risk will come up. And that's what we will have to be looking for in the near future. Very complex, and we still have lots more information to share. But as we come to the end of this section, we must stop thinking of CJD as rare and random. In a world where those persistent spike proteins are circulating, which have prion-like capabilities, prion disease may no longer be a distant threat, but an urgent signal. Great, thank you very much for staying with me for the first part. If you've been on YouTube, um, if you want to see the full presentation, there will be a link to it um, later on. For those who have signed up for the webinar, please stay with me to the end. We still have a lot more information to go through. And uh, so we'll just play a quick outro for YouTube audience. Have a great evening, those of you who have been with me, and we'll continue to keep you up to date on the science.